Welcome to Marin Poets Live. I'm Nishama Franklin. I work at the Fairfax Library, and I love poetry. After this program airs on TV, it will appear on the Marin Free Library website as part of a digital archive, which also features biographies of the poets and links to our collection. Today, we feature poet Kasrof Chantikian. Welcome, Kasrof. Thank you very much, Nishama. Great to be with you today. Yes. So, a Marin poem, if you would. That's the way we start here. I think this would be entitled to be considered a Marin poem because it's, uh, we have a beautiful dogwood tree. Ah. And uh, my wife, Catherine Herman, is a, a landscape architect, so she has great visions of the ah. garden and she's produced great things. So, hmm. the, the dogwood tree inspired me. Yes. <clears throat> dogwood tree. 1. November 1st. The leaves of the dogwood tree are dying in autumn. The young tree will grow taller next year. Yet the leaves are dying today, green, red, and brown, scattered on the ground. A few days ago, the leaves appeared strong, all red, full of vitality, filled with the sun, determined to live. I walked into the garden to look at the dogwood, to see the colors more closely. The leaves had fallen covering a small, tough patch of earth. I know why the leaves fell from the branches. It was time to die. And when death comes, nothing can remain standing. The leaves fell, nudged on by the late afternoon wind. Death is the other side, the side you cannot see, nor gaze upon, nor allowed to touch or dream about, not kiss or invite home for dinner, serious conversation. Death is the end of your dreams. In early November, the leaves of the dogwood tree are dead. 2. November 2nd. The cold morning wind shaking the leaves as if shivering, the red leaves with black and brown blotches like tumors on the skin, imperfections and stain that will not be healed. The dogwood is surrounded by the live oak and five bays and a thin spider web stretches from one branch to another. The leaves are dead, but the spider is alive, impatient, waiting to eat. Three, 11 months later, when the time comes to die, death will not wait, not because death is impatient. It is something else. What would the point be of waiting? There is a certain order inherent in living things. Do you know what it is? Some seem to think they know and have said, death occurs so that life may be possible. But then a philosopher comes along and restates the proposition. Life, he meant being, always heads toward death. This idea gets picked up and is tossed around for a while, and others hearing it begin to believe it. It's an odd thing when ideas become so worshipful, and for that reason alone, most people will accept it, declare that it could not be false, will demand to believe it, because it has respectability, like hard cash, like a buck in your hand. But why should death, even the death of leaves from the dogwood tree in our garden, be said to be the final destruction of life, of living, of the green, then red, then yellow, brown, dogwood leaf. Could it not just as well be said, oh, could it not be said that life is headed for love? Mm, I was wondering how you were going to get out of that grave you dug yourself. <laughs> and I was also very interested that you did not give us the dogwood in its fullness that you stuck with your, the problem that grabbed you. You, you. you were going to look death smack in the face, which very few people are willing to do. Right, um, right. And so that, that's an admirable poem. Thank um, you. And, and it, 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 the combination of nature and then, then the kind of world of the mind and the world of philosophy and how they intertwined in there. Very interesting stuff. The philosopher, in case... Um, Somebody wants to know is Heidegger. I do want to know him. Thank you very much. Okay, another one, please. Uh, this next one is called 
and the woman. And somebody asked me how I wrote this. It was published uh, in 2008. And all I could respond was to say, I don't know. It just came to me whole. Uh, poems come in different ways to different people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a long time to write. Sometimes it's just a few minutes. So this one is the latter case. And when the woman, and when the woman, very beautiful, came home, came home from the moon, from the stars, the lost holy places, what could I say? Oh, your face of love, your hand wrapped in the wind, the tree of water began to cry, the wrens and sparrows were dressed, the river stopped to greet you, the sky came down to meet the singing branches, the trees where the birds sat talking, full of fire, full of hunger, and love arrived at home here with me. Mm. It has a taste of Arabian Nights in it. I, at least that's what it set off in me, because that woman just encompassed everything beautiful, you know, both cosmic and sensual. Um, and so I just, I, I don't believe that they all, that the poem comes at once. I think you work on it inside without knowing it, and then it's ready to be born. But that, That's you know, it, sound, it sounds like kind of a, you know, a meteor or a galaxy coming, yeah. coming out on the page. Well, it's very interesting, the reference to the Arabian Nights. I hadn't oh. thought of that myself, okay. but it's always, one of the great things is about poems is talking with someone and getting a Yeah, well, really the talking bird in there was part of it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, this next poem was published, uh, will be published in January 2015 in Snow Jewel Journal, um, Gray Sparrow Journal. And it's called Eloise and Abelard. The old carved writings on the tomb you are reading states unassumingly that the remains of Eloise and Abelard are joined together in this grave. You have come in the slow Paris rain walking among the aisles and aisles of dead chestnut trees to pay homage as one visitor in the cemetery called the City of the Dead. The voice within your heart is quiet as you begin to hear what she whispers to him. My dreams were crushed, but let us not talk of that, not here in this cloudy afternoon and cold humming of the rain. Now you see you and I have been given time to tell our friends and those who knew of us not to complain of where we sleep and not to let what happened back then ever happen again. Mm. What a kind of an anthem to take with you when things turn unpleasant. <laughs> it's, 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 it's going to eternal verities and it's going to the patients of the dead and of the wonderful old stories that are kind of embedded in us one way or another. The graves were separate at mm -hmm. one time, and then the, and fr the French government declared that ah. we were going to bring them to Paris and ah. put them together. Which and don't they have something growing between them, or is that just part of the legend? Uh, you know, something so grew up from each and intertwined. It's in my head somewhere. That may have been legend. Okay. Uh, the, yes. If you see, if you see the cemetery, it's it's sort of a small structure, ah. and uh, and underneath you see the two tombs. Mm -hmm. But they're constantly were they were at that time working on. They're still working on it probably now. Yes, yes, that's that's grand. What comes next? This is an unpublished poem I've been working on for a while. It's called "If Love Were a Color." If love were a color, could be a color, it would be red. Red for the love that speaks to you in the night, made of primitive flesh. Love that may already be dying because you abandoned her promised desire. Love trying to remember the exact location she started from, because on first seeing you, love became mesmerized. She was going to remind you not to consume the remaining days issuing pleas that insist the decay of days has arrived, that as soon as the faraway stars were born, the refutation of immortality had begun. Even love is not so sure of herself anymore, for she, for she has forgotten the colors in her portfolio, those light pencil sketches she drew of the autumn sky, 
the fear of abduction that stirs in her mind, the regret of the dawn that once having shouted, love is lost, yet urging you not to forget to see clearly, awake or asleep. Thus read for the romance and risk you take that love will vanish in one more blink and night run away to hide in the sea. And read for the anguish of autumn's memory of heavy rain and the scutter, scattered blood as the leaves change colors. Of how you wake so early in the morning and your voice tells me, look at the words of first light. Read for the imagination that creates the listening of tones and shadows and the composition of fire in the core of your heart from which you allowed me to watch the light be born. And read for the handmade wings from Daedalus whose warning Icarus forgot in the flight of fancy falling dead into the sea. If love dies, what will happen tonight? Night is the living garden of love's song and is afraid love is missing and does not know anymore where to go. When part of you is not with you, is lost, is there any point of having anything else? Read for the healing that love brings even when you are alone in a place of nothing. Read for the transformation of that nothingness. Read for the color of laughter, even when death threatens you with having always the better hand. And read for the metamorphosis of dead worlds. When the songs of light are heard again, and the frozen love that thought itself still dead erupts from the bowels of the earth. Night even that fled to hide in the sea. And read for the awakening from the dream of believing yourself lost in somewhere. Read for the wind returning home to sleep and your dream of how it came to be. Read for the sky taking love and returning it into night. And read as it refutes and dismantle, dismantles all that has lost authenticity. I give it to you now. If love were color, could be a color, it would be red. That's one complicated Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so glad that you that there was that little bit of, it doesn't have to be always red. There was a little pastel in there. There was, you know, there, it's just so multi-layered. Um, and there's so much about love and loss. I think those, you, you know, those seem to be the themes mm -hmm. that drive your poetry. Right, right. And it's, it's exciting to see them develop. So let's see what's come, gonna come next. This one uh, is called, uh, scent of things burning. It begins sometimes in the most ordinary way, yet not the way in which you would have expected or predicted might happen. You are ordering a meal at the restaurant. Someone is with you. You begin to speak about the menu. Your companion does not hear your voice. You think this might be the beginnings of how dreams assert themselves in your life. Is life forgotten? when we assume it's time for chatter? Or is it by chance the exact moment when the world reveals itself to you? No one ever came for my order, and the person I thought I was sitting next to in the cafe turns out to have been only the reflection of my desire, my expectation not to be alone, my hope to be with someone, with you. I hear the voice dictating some lines that I write down as I wait for the one who eventually does not come. Afterwards, I get up from my chair at the table, walk out, and look up at the night. I begin the unplanned recitation to what seems to me the lonely sky. The scent of things burning, cold ideas, numbers that have lost their digits, memories thrown away, the path home forgotten, books you have lost, that one day you walked away. Let go the random dead leaves stranded in the street. Burn the tangled particles, jamming the blood breathing in your heart. Throw out the customs that make you so stiff enough to scream. What is left? One or two questions you promise to ask. But to whom? The body of the night or the mind of the sky? And what would happen if one or both responded? Would you hear what they said? or what you were hoping was said. Mm. That's so dreamlike. And no one came to take the order. <laughs> it is so sad. Um, and it is so lonely. Yeah. 
And, and also, I love the way that it's very, it starts very grounded, almost like a journal entry. You know, I was sitting there, and, you know, and, and then it went into the cosmos. Yeah, I've never met such a person, but I was just trying uh -huh. to imagine what would happen because loneliness has so many kinds of directions it can go in. Yes. Yes, I, I bet I, I, you are not lonely in your life, it sounds like, with your lovely landscape architect, who is also a librarian that I know. No, but, she's, a, but, she's a great inspiration. Exactly, to me. and that's wonder, it's wonderful. But this is where the dark, sad stuff can come out and get light and air, you know, which is the healing nature of poetry. But then that's just the time from which I met Catherine. Ah. What about oh. the times I didn't know her? Coming, yes. Moving from the East Coast to California, ah. not knowing anyone, being lonely, okay. being alone. But there's that seed of poetry. If you were all happy, it wouldn't come out oh, no. like that. Exactly. So it's great. We have about 10 minutes. I'm just giving you a heads <clears throat> okay. up. This poem was published in 2008. It's called On Death. I had a conversation with someone about death. It wasn't the topic that anyone was thinking of. It was just, it came up during dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, I felt an urge just to write this. I, I couldn't sleep. So this is, what, this is what happened on death. A few days ago at dinner, you, confer you confessed your uncertainties, your fear, the doubts you still have, the feeling that erodes your face that look you get when your eyes tremble, as if someone has tried to murder the air by stepping on it, by spitting at the sun, as if to put it out. You wonder if poets know anything about dying. You would surely like to know what it's like, how to approach it carefully, you think, because you want this event, this transaction, that you believe proves the contingency of the world. You want it to be like a slow brushing of the, your teeth, something you are accustomed to doing, something you can finish with easily, like dinner, that will have a definite end, so you can get up from the table or leave the restaurant, something you can renounce or nullify at will, something definable under your control, like a poem, because you believe poems are made like houses, where each word is not any more miraculous than a brick or a piece of plywood, that all it takes is to put the stones and wood together, and is the poem, you wonder, the building of it, any different, or anyone's life any different than stones or wood or glue? Isn't it what you call life a putting together of winters and spring? This is what you believe. You want death to be the same. You want to be able to spit at it, to compress it, to lock it inside your baggy pants, to crush it with your heavy wallet. You think now that death ought to be asking you for permission making at least an appointment to see you. On a Saturday morning, you will be ready. You will have all the arguments written, memorized, ready to shout them if need be. You'll begin with mountains and then move on to literature. Pretend to philosophize, as professors still do. Demonstrate that death could not exist because it is only the bad dreams we have. Still, it might be well, just in case, to see what poets know. What is death really like? Have you any information for me? A booklet, perhaps? A sketch of what to expect? Anything will do, but I must have something, something that tells me what the rules are, what, they'll, what the rules will be. You see, I have an appointment soon, and I must be prepared. I must show what I know. Mm. That, that is oddly charming because it has a kind of that you know the baggy pants and the heavy wallet and the this kind of stuff um it's really playing with very heavy serious material in a kind of a delightful way that's interesting the the uh, what you just said of the of the wallet and and so uh -huh. on those are the things that we see all of the time yeah um but we don't really uh, if that happens all the time, we're not ready to think about certain things. Right. And, and if someone hasn't thought about this, this is what happens. It's exactly. like wood and glue and, and mm -hmm. stones. Yeah. I can do that too. You know? Right, right. 
Okay, six minutes, just so you know. This is an unpublished poem. It's called Morning. It is all blue here and there is no wind. The hawk floats and turns slowly, searching not for love, only to lie with you. Here death would be greeted civilly with food and tea and conversation. You want to know if death ever sleeps. You did not ask if such a power that can grasp your thin throat and crush your bones, can such power be grounded, be authentic? You wondered if death, the idea of death, can love, love the one it has a duty to take away. So you ask death, are you capable of love? or is it forbidden? You had the feeling suddenly when you become aware you should not have spoken, and yet you saw that death would not speak, only move away slowly, so as not to become engaged in fruitless conversation with you and to, to prohibit the forming of friendship with someone from this world like you, for whom death's only mission is to escort you on the journey to that nether realm. But what kind of place could that be? You agree it is better to do things with the air of formality, quickly, as when the student turns in the examination to the proctor whose disinterested, whose disinterested face is immediately forgotten. This is the rule, business rule of death, simplicity with no involvement, efficiency with no deviation for, un, for unscripted intervention such as rain or dreams, no relationship with the living, no thoughts of music or of trees, not even laughter. Poor death, lost in its calendar of myriad appointments, overwhelmed by the repetitive, repetitive elements of its job, bored stiff with no potential for advancement and stuck for almost eternity with no one to speak to. Look to yourself and see that fear is an arbitrary pose to take. Let my ashes be buried quietly, but with joy. Invite the nightingale and sparrow. Let it be by the two tall dogwoods if possible, in bloom, in your garden in late March or early April, and in the white mountains, nearby the ancient bristlecold pines, still living, breathing, and stubbornly awake and unafraid to die. Wow. Well, that's the poem that that inquirer wanted. There you have it. It's very, very nice. I, I, like, the, I like the way it goes. I, I like the way it ends on that kind of um, oddly joyous note. I mean, why not? The first time I saw the bristle cone pine, oh. I, was, I was amazed. It's yes. approximately close to 5,000 years old or more. Right, right. So stripped down and so alive. With that, there's sap. You know, there's, it's kind of like a skeleton that, in, in which the, the, everything is moving. It's moving and it, yeah. it won't go away. Yes. Yes, now, two minutes. Here you go. Okay. This is it, <laughs> perhaps. This is called uh, Origins of Language. I, I, I've thought about the first people who began speaking, but what was, what was the push that caused that? And so this is, this is sort of uh, looking at what that might have been. Origins of language. It began with seeing you, the way you stared at, the, at me one day in the rain, your hands gesturing rapidly through the air, the scent of wild sage you rubbed on your skin, and the sounds you uttered filled into my throat. Overheard large birds, overhead large birds peered down curious about deciphering what you might have said. Eating red berries, day lilies and violets with you, the thought of your firm skin, tasting your mouth, the red and orange mixture of the dawn, watching how quickly you ran up the cliff of rocks, emulating how birds fly, naming your body, tongue and lips, beginning to understand the meaning of symbols and words, trying to make out the implications of sounds, the logic of your smile, and how those sewing these thoughts together became phrases of meaning, the words we came to remember. Then you're singing out loud to the sky that we believed a part of us was. That's a wonderful way to end. 
because it is, I, 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 we have like a minute, but I don't want to cram a poem in there unless you have like a tiny one. Um, because it's just, um, it, it's interesting that words are sensual. That's the, they, they come out of the senses for you. And that's what you want to celebrate in your words is that that which still is living in death will come. We all know that. And the words provide an image. It could be exactly. sensual and or so erotic. Together. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very, very lovely. So I think, Kasrov, we will end right here on a wonderful note. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you today.